Hey, fam. Hey, can you see me? Yes. I can see. Yes. Cool. Can you <laughs> see I never do this from my phone. So you guys have pushed me outside of my comfort level. Thank you. Yes, it's what we do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is this your first time doing Instagram Live? Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, wonderful. We have so many folks. Actually, one of our folks is right here with us, Camilla. She, uh, there was, that was the time that she did Insta with us. Live with us was the first time that she was doing it too. There's a lot of folks who are doing it like that. Yeah, so I'm I'm really excited. If if you looked at my profile at all, you'll see that I only have ten posts of ever having it because I, <laughs> I I have an Android and so I don't really know how to use it. And everybody has an iPhone and it's different. Right. So even when they try to show me, or like that's why I got nervous about your instructions. I was like, oh god, but oh. It was super easy. It worked. First try. I have an Android, so oh, that's okay. probably why. Okay. Yeah, so happy to give you instruction anytime you need them. Just reach out. <laughs> Let me. I appreciate it. I'm going to try to find some things so that I can lift my camera a little bit higher so I can be eye okay. level. So let me see if I can find something to put it on just really quick. Sounds good. You're getting support from my folks saying, I feel you. You got this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. So that's Keisha. That is the human that we are going to be uh, speaking with today, Keisha Linebaugh. Um, very interesting the kind of work that Keisha is doing and she's very uniquely placed to give us um, perspective on what is happening now in a way that we aren't possibly talking about it. Um, so with all of our protests and our black community out there um, demanding social justice, demanding justice for all of the um, killings that are happening across the country that have historically been happening um, for decades and decades now, they are for some reason being treated, well, for reasons, being treated as isolated incidents, and really they're not. Um, this is years and years of systemic destruction. This is years and years of systemic oppression that has put our black community in a certain space, forcing them not to rupture. And that rupture is exa exactly what we are seeing in this moment. And so a lot of the conversation constantly revolves around looting and rioting and, and the value of property. And so I wanted to bring Keisha in, who is a realtor with a very unique perspective. I'm going to ask her to share that as well, who is a realtor. And so she works with property in communities and has... Uh, the perspective that we need to actually speak on this subject in an educated manner, right? So Keisha, will you share with us, I know you've been doing social justice for a while, you're also a realtor, and you bring a very specific lens, like I was telling our viewers, you bring a very specific lens to the table in how you do your work, in how what you know informs your work. Would you willing be willing to share that perspective with us today? Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me on today. I really am excited about the opportunity to share just some of the experiences that I have, some of the information I have. I by no means to claim to be an expert on this. And hopefully this is the beginning of a much broader conversation, because one of the things that I even learned once I started delving into the social justice aspects of real estate is that it really touches every area of one's life, right? Um, so when people are saying, that housing is a human right um, that really goes much deeper than just the roof over your head or the four walls around you. It really starts to stick to like your safety, your opportunities, your ability to accumulate wealth and provide for your family in addition to that shelter. And so um, just to give you a little background about me, um, I um, started my activism work very early in the Tampa Bay area. Um, many of you may be familiar with local radio station WMNF 88.5 um, that always had opportunities for young people to get involved. Um, and once I moved away to school, got degrees, all of that stuff, um, I worked in sales and marketing for many, many years. And I started to realize that, you know, that wasn't necessarily the correct space for me. Um, in terms of, you know, these questions that I had around how is it that some people get access to certain opportunities that other people with the same education level and background may not have available. And so these questions of race, class, gender, socioeconomics 
started to really bubble up in my heart. Um, and then through no fault of mine, um, I had an opportunity to leave the corporate world. I always joke that I retired and became a realtor, <laughs> which is by no means am I retired. This is a lot of work. Um, <laughs> But I came into real estate with the encouragement of a mentor of mine and my husband, and I really haven't wanted to look back. And part of that is what I finally found in this space was the ability to combine all of those areas that I mentioned and really make an impact on people's lives and on the neighborhoods and community right here in the Tampa Bay area. And um, it's just something that's so rewarding. And so my team, um, the Living Loving team, we're based in Tampa, but we work all over the Tampa Bay area. And our driving philosophy is community-minded real estate. And what do we mean by that, right? Um, well, what we mean is that real estate isn't just about the paycheck that you can get by helping someone buy a house. It's not the speculation that you do by purchasing property to hold to then sell later. It's really about thinking about each unique community, what their needs are, what the need of your friends, families, and customers are that are seeking out these areas and helping the two of them connect together. So. The examples that we like to use, people always ask us, what kind of people do you help? Well, we don't really have a demographic or a type of person. The type of people that we help are seeking. They are seeking to find their place where they too can insert themselves and give back, create, um, build healthy, positive communities, and therefore create spaces of safety for everyone around them. Um, and so, you know, what that means is oftentimes we have people that are community activists that we all know working at a nonprofit may not afford you the $300,000 that's the medium home price here in the Tampa Bay area, but do not despair because there are programs, there are neighborhoods, there are organizations that can assist people. And there are just too many um, people in the real estate industry that are looking for that quick dollar that don't take the time to help educate people. So our team comes from a community perspective, we come from an education perspective, and we come in looking to the future. This is our home, these are our communities, and we want it to be a great place for our friends, children, our children, and our families to grow up and thrive. We want it to be safe. We want this to be a model for other areas around the country to help with some of this hard work that needs to be done around this area. And I believe that real estate is a foundation where massive change can be effective. That's incredible. That's incredible. Um, so when you're talking about real estate being a space where massive change can be enacted, right? Do you mean by accumulation of wealth? Well, I, um, I think it's a combination. So one of the things that I've learned as I get, you know, more into this with the cross section of social justice and real estate is that in many white families and majority culture families, they're starting to be taught about property value and the accumulation of wealth and home ownership and the benefits of that from very early ages. Um, you know, we, we have some customers that have been wonderful and great to help that are in their mid and early 20s that are already achieving the dream of home ownership, right? Um, and then I started to look and see, well, wait a minute, um, not only do people of color and marginalized, marginalized people have less rates of home ownership overall, but when you look at that younger demographic, it's almost not inclusive. So I'm a huge believer in education, and I think that a free and easy way to just change that disparity is to start educating young minority and marginalized people about the different steps that it takes to have home ownership, right? The different things that you need to do, the way that you need to look at the world, your um, work environment, all of these things just as a foundation, as an initial thought even, before, you know, we start delving into, okay, what are the barriers? Because let's be serious, there are some significant ones. Um, so I think that that's the first and easiest step is to just 
just help more young people know what they can't know because their parents and grandparents probably don't have that knowledge to pass down to them. They probably weren't homeowners. And if they were, it's probably a generation out. Um, and so there's a lot of lost knowledge that translates into wealth, in my opinion. So that's probably one of the most fundamental ways, but really um, the biggest way is that we all have to start diving into the way that race, property, and the system collide. Um, and there are just some really great resources out there. And, and I feel like this conversation is going to get a little bit more into that. So, um, you know, just to keep it kind of in pieces, that, that first section is an educational one that can go such a long way. And I do feel that it's the responsibility of, you know, K through 12 and higher education. Like, why isn't there a life courses class? Why isn't there, you know, why aren't there resources for young people getting out of high school to learn about what they need to do for their long-term future, not just tomorrow? Right. I know that in speaking with some of my young humans and some of the year-round programming that we were doing, that idea of financial education, right, that, that question of why don't we have financial education for us um, kept coming up. And most of my humans were asking that question, most of my young humans who were asking this, that, that question were young humans of color. You know, so there is a desire to want to know, but there are not enough resources, I feel, for them to reach into. So I can see, Keisha, that you are coming from a very community-centered, grassroots approach of how to do real estate, right? Um, and so it focuses the community first before it focuses the actual ownership of property. Okay, sure. so pivoting a little bit into the social justice piece, a lot of the questions and the conversations coming upon us now with um, the protests that we have happening nationally on a regular basis um, is around the value of property and the role of property in social justice activism. There is a lot of criticism. I won't say critique because I'm not seeing a lot of critique. I'm seeing a lot of criticism of direct action and a lot of priority being placed on property. Right? And I'm seeing a lot of questioning of that kind of logic with marginalized humans asking why so you will prioritize property in a certain way but what about the lives of humans of color especially black humans yes and so i was hoping you could offer some perspective on what the relationship since you work with property and you work you know in social justice what is the relationship uh if you can give us as long as you want to take, because I'm sure it's going to take a minute, uh, some sort of systemic, historical, economic impact related idea of what is the relationship between marginalized humans and property, because I think that is a huge part, that's a huge piece of the conversation that is absolutely missing. So, and Sam, you're absolutely right. And this is one of those places where, you know, let's hold a safe space and let people know that, you know, this could get uncomfortable because we're about to delve into the fact that the private industry, the federal government and policy and the way it was created was not accidental. So there's a huge void in the understanding of, you know, white America and the reality of black America and property and home ownership. There's always a narrative about that. You know, you hear about these bootstraps, right? You've got to pull yourself up by the bootstraps or if you work hard, you work extra hard, you're going to get ahead. Well, that would all be well and good if the playing field and the rules were not literally designed to prevent black and brown people from owning property and from accessing certain opportunities for wealth. And um, just to, you know, just to be specific, and you may have heard me allude to it, but let's just jump right in and talk about redlining and what that means. And for people who don't understand, who have never heard that term, um, there was a policy that was created in New Jersey. Um, I don't want to get into dates because that's going to mess me up. What I had a history teacher was just like, keep what came before the other and you're good. So um, this redlining initially started um, right around the time that soldiers started returning from World War II. 
um, and the housing markets were booming and the federal government got involved and said, what are we going to do to get all of these people into homes? Because th this American dream is starting to bubble up that everybody's going to have a home with a red door and a white picket fence and a two car garage, and we're all going to live happily ever after. And so the federal government sees the need not just for housing for all of these soldiers, but also for some funding on how are you going to get people into homes? So they start to create policies that are um, the loans that we see today. And within, written into those policies are the same sort of safeguards that we see today. Like how do you evaluate risk? Um, how do you evaluate the ability to pay? Um, you know, how do you evaluate the just the values of the properties that you're lending on? And so they came up with systems and within those systems, they decided that black and brown people were more risky, that places that black and brown bodies inhabited were inherently less in value, and that um, the ultimate ability to pay was obviously less because these were black and brown bodies. And so as these assumptions were made, these became federal policies that got not just enacted across you know, the different towns and local municipalities, but across the whole country to where this was a legal method of determining who could borrow money, where they could borrow it, and how much. And for the most part, black and brown people were excluded from this altogether. So right then we start, and, and you know, I'm just picking up from there because we don't have all day to get into this, but right then we start to see the massive wealth gap and disparities in home ownership take off. Um, and it's sad to say that today, black and brown people own less property than they did during Jim Crow eras of the South. Like, that is so disturbing. And I asked myself, you're probably asking, I said, why? Why is that? Well, it, because in the 1970s, we get the Equal Housing Opportunity Act, right? We get all kinds of rules and regulations about the ending of redlining. But what we did, because the system has a way of being stuck in itself, especially when the same creators of the system are supposed to be the modifiers of the system. We get mm -hmm. you know, different rules, but we don't necessarily get a different intention. We don't necessarily get a different perspective that can bring us out of where we've been. And so what happened at that point is we get these rules and regulations, but we don't get any teeth or reporting um, mandates or anything like this. So still today, you can look at communities and look at the red line. Um, and this is that was one of the things here in the Tampa Bay area that got me interested in all of this and got me thinking passionately about it. Um, you know, there are certain parts of East Tampa where as a realtor, if you're looking at values, you can literally cross a street and not only see where all of a sudden the values, the, va the values plummet, but then you also start to see black and brown faces, right? And so you start to ask yourself what's going on. And ultimately, it's about these rules that were in place that still persist today. And, and, and don't be mistaken, these, these type of things are still happening every single day. Um, but what you start to see is that when you make rules about who can live where, and then you make loans based on that for 50, 60, 70 years, there starts to become what looks like self-segregation, but really it's being guided by an invisible policy. When you start to say that black and brown people are inherently less able to pay based on a formula that's 100 years old, they now start to lose access to not only areas that they may have wanted to expand into, but also their own neighborhoods as they gentrify. Um, because let's let's be real. There was a long time where living in the cities was not as desirable as moving out to the suburbs, whether it be for health or safety or beauty or any of these things. So where did black and brown bodies end up? Congregated around the cities in the first inner loop, walkable, public transit, very close to urban cores. Well, now we see a trend where the urban core for multiple reasons is super popular and therefore it starts to expand out that more people want to move in and these people that have historically been there are getting pushed out.
and these assumptions that inherently black and brown people are less able to pay now prices them out of their own neighborhoods and communities. So really another area that can be dismantled to kind of go back to that question is that we have got to delve into the policies of lending and we have got to have all the players at the table. And that means policymakers, activists, black and brown people, especially elected officials, mortgage, banking, finance people. And everybody has to really start to look at where are we and how can we do better? Because we can do better and our communities will be stronger and healthier if we do do better. Diversity is a strength and there are neighborhoods in all of Tampa Bay that show us this time and time again. And I think that that should be the model that we strive for. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that perspective. Folks who are, I know a bunch of folks have joined us as well. Folks who are watching, if you have any questions, please feel free to enter them in the comments. And um, I will present those questions to Keisha. And if she is willing and able, she will go ahead and answer. And from what I know of Keisha, if she does not have an answer, she will certainly um, direct us in, a, in the direction that we should be going into. Right? Um, Keisha? You will, I, I know you will. I absolutely know you will. Um, so Keisha, real quick, before anybody plays this role, I'm going to, before anybody decides to play the devil's advocate card, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to go right back to the beginning where you talked about redlining and how that began, right? And say from, from the get, it was nothing, it, there was no reason other than race that certain parts of town and certain property areas were under were valued less than others, right? Absolutely. And not only that, not only was it based on race. And let's be clear, in the early, you know, in the early 1900s, yes, there were some immigrant populations that were impacted by this as well, because they were also considered less American. Um, but the rules were were drawn up based on race. And it went so far not just to say that you could not loan to someone, but also to explicitly exclude brown and black people from the new suburban boom. Um, you were not allowed to lend to black and brown people in the suburbs. It just was not, a, you could not do that. And so, you know, I don't know all of the intricacies of these policies. I, there are people who've spent lifetimes studying it. Um, like I said, there's a wonderful article that helped inform me called Race for Profit. It's actually a book now by a young woman named Kianaga Yamada Taylor. Um, and I, I really encourage you to get into that. She gets into statistics in-depth details, some really, really deep down into the policy piece that we just wouldn't have time for today. But the main thing that I want to stress over and over and over when we talk about this is these policies were not accidental. They were not accidental. They were designed for the purpose of segregating Black people away from white people. And that was the point, and it worked. And it continues to have its impact all the way to today. Impact. And to be fair, one of the things that I would like to point out is that now and in communities, you see with these the, the CRA um, communities, we hear about this federal policy that's happening. So this is all in the intent to rectify some of these wrongs, to drive investment into areas that have been blighted because of other different policies that have been neglected because of redlining. And so you get this public-private government partnership that's supposed to be working. Well, the fundamental foundation of that, in my opinion, prevents success because we have not dismantled the core issues that have prevented the natural organic growth of those communities in the first place. So you can put in, you know, some retail and shopping into an area where the median income is three times below the poverty level and those businesses are going to fail. Um, you okay. know, you can, right, you can try to build affordable housing for people that are making less than a living wage and they're still not going to be able to afford it. And so, again, I want to stress that this, this collision of private industry, federal government, 
and you know the making of policy for profit is what we have to look at and i know how tough that is i like i said i come from a business background i get it but if we're truly going to build a socially just society and communities that are healthy for our children in the future these are some of the areas that we have to look at the consequences can be intentional or unintentional but they impact lives the same certainly so what i'm hearing is there is this expectation to spend when they are creating these stopgap policies almost right like band-aid policies there's like expectation to spend without necessarily analyzing what is the spending power of the humans who occupy that space and what is preventing them from having that kind of spending power that they could actually engage in any of the whatever the retail uh, stores or whatever it is that they put that the government chooses to put in these areas right, right. Mm-hmm. um and i think there's a lot of that i'm seeing you know like i know this for a fact but in this current time i am seeing a lot of that basic understanding so there's like the surface level understanding and an immediate move to solution as opposed to a deeper level understanding of what the fundamental issue is the root of the issue is and then going from there to a solution level and i strongly think that's because that's too much work Well, I think that it's too much work and I also think this always for me every question always goes back to education and we don't know what we don't know and you know mm-hmm. people say that often but it's so true and so fundamentally we see the problem we jump to solution and we're not educated and I include myself in that I learn more and more every day about real estate right. about race relations in this country about what it looks like to be in a marginalized community um i i cannot claim to come from a marginalized community other than the color of my skin and my gender i guess now i'm i guess i guess maybe um, <laughs> but i mean i have to okay. i have to be fair in that my level of privilege is very different than other people who may look exactly the same way as me and my access to information and education i view as a responsibility when i'm approaching mm-hmm. a problem with a solution i believe that i have to learn more and dive deeper and these problems and again that's why i stress this so much these problems are multifaceted we cannot just take housing in a silo and think that it solves everything i think that it should be the first thing that we look at in a lot of ways in probably in parallel with education because you have to be safe you cannot have any higher thought until your until your safety is met and and that is housing so i do think it's one of the top priorities but it's not alone in a silo um you know i think one, there was a question that i saw pop up and um i don't know who asked it but i think that it speaks directly to what we're saying right now you know yeah. it asks how we can be inclusive in this and how people can be allies and so what i would say directly to this this concept of housing is to understand the communities where you live and to start to rather than think of development is making a community better allowing cohesiveness in development so let's say you have a blighted part of town where are all of the people that have interest in that part of town where are their voices when something gets made what do they need the simple asking of that question do they need another you know government housing development is that what they're asking for or do they need jobs or do they need healthcare or do they need a road that actually links them to public transit versus siphons them off into a section where they don't have easy access for maneuverability um and when i go to town halls and open public forums where the you know the government is asking these questions and i think that our local government asks a lot and i do believe that they try um i've lived in other areas where they do not and so i know the difference and i do believe that tampa bay has a vision for the future that could work for everybody but i just don't think that the voices of the people it matters to get to the table enough and when they do get to the table i don't think that they're allowed to manage and drive the conversation the way that they need to for the real solutions to come out 
And that's just so, my opinion on that. No, those are some excellent points, right? Figuring out what our community needs. Is this actually be going to be, or rather, what can we bring into the community that will be beneficial to the community? So asking the question first before bringing anything into the community and then ensuring that the voices that need to be at the table are at the table, are being heard, and then are taking leadership in the conversation. Or, right, like having that, uh, both the capacity, the access, and the support, I think. That was Maria Jose's question um, about solidarity, providing that kind of support, that kind of backup to minority communities. Because I'm also, much like you, I'm also, I also live in a lot of privilege. You know, so I recognize where you're coming from with checking that privilege, and I greatly appreciate it, um, right? But I think, like, humans like you and me, too, uh, humans who belong to marginalized communities like you and me, too, can use our privilege to ensure that the right voices are getting to the table and are being allowed, not being tokenized that one time, right? right? Are being allowed to stay there and are not being pushed out of the conversation, after they've they've made one appearance. Exactly, and I think it's very important for us, for black and brown people, for marginalized people, when you see the people that straddle the lines, like I, I make a joke that my superpower is the ability to bring people that would not normally ever interact or meet to bring them together and create dialogues. Um, so far it's been a positive superpower and I'm grateful for it, but I don't try to, I don't try to sugarcoat the challenges that it comes, that come with straddling two worlds, right? And so I think it's very important for marginalized people to amplify the voices of the people that they want to represent them. It is not, I will never stand up and try to speak for all of African-Americans and black and brown people. I will never stand up and try to say that I know what the white community wants and expects of black and brown people. But I see people that are out there doing work and my goal is to amplify their voice and to connect them to people that can amplify their voice 10 times more. And um, I think that that's very important. Absolutely. Um, you are community Tampa Bay, just FYI. Because <laughs> that is our superpower too. So, you know, 100%. That is exactly what we do. And I love that. I love that that is your superpower as well. well um, so we have. Yeah, I've been a huge supporter of Camp Anytown since high school. I mean, since Community Tampa Bay. I didn't get to make it into Camp Anytown, but I had a lot of friends that benefited from it. And um, the spirit lives alive and well in a lot of us. I love that. I love that, fam. I also, unfortunately, never got to go to the program, but my first day at Community Tampa Bay was my first day of any town. So, <laughs> yeah, it was an intense and incredible experience all in the same breath. Um, so we do have a couple of questions. So I'm going to, Elois is asking us, what are some practices and ways black people can turn their generational trauma and current rage into positive release practices? I know myself and so many others have bottling up rage. Sure. Well, I can't necessarily speak to some of the emotional health aspects of that. Um, you know, there, I think that it would, we'd be well served to talk about the mental health and the emotional health of generational rage and generational grief, um, which to me are the exact same thing. Um, but the positive, the, the things that you can do to turn it positive, the positive things is look around the areas where, if we and I'm just going to keep this in the real estate realm where I, I feel comfortable for now, if that's okay. Um, so think about, think about the communities and the neighborhoods that we live in that are marginalized or that are predominantly black. Um, some of the things that you can do is to organize your own neighbors, even on your street, of how can we help the elderly homeowners with their property so that they're not getting liens for not mowing the grass over and over and over until you know people are coming from their homes there are programs in the city of tampa that can help with that so it doesn't have to be a cost out of your pocket it just has to be your time and your ability to knock on your neighbor's door and ask them if they need help um, that's one way we look at some communities that have gotten there, I, I think that there's such a level of hopelessness that occurs when you get in layer and layer and layer of repression upon you that something mm -hmm. as simple as 
cleaning out the storm drains so that you don't flood and back up with sewage every time it rains. Because how depressing is that? You know, every time it rains, you've got to walk out of your front door because into mud and muck and grossness and garbage. So even just being the community organizer that helps clean up your community. And again, involving the people that have stakes and not ever being a person that is putting a solution onto another community. You know, number one, going to community associations and asking, what do you need? What do you need to feel supported as a community? And then listening and then doing the work to put those things forward. I think that's a very small positive step that doesn't have to, you don't have to be rich to do that. Absolutely. Lois, so um, a friend of, in response to, to add to your response, right? Um, a friend of mine and I were talking yesterday and both of us too have a lot of rage. They more than me. Um, because they are a black identified individual, right? And so um, they are experiencing the lack of safety. They are experiencing the anger. They are experiencing the hopelessness, the complete lack of power, the helplessness, right, in this current context. And so there's a lot of anger boiling up. And, you know, we're, we're talking to each other because we don't necessarily have other spaces in which we can share our rage and be justified in sharing the level of rage that we have, be validated in sharing the rage that we have. So we share it with each other until we came to a point where we were like, we need to center ourselves. Our rage is valid, right? And we need to be able to find other humans with whom we can share this, you for me and me for you. Um, but also we need to center ourselves and find something tangible that we can work on because what we are enraged about is an intangible system. Right right, is a generational intangible system that lives out there in the galaxy, in the universe, that we can't touch and that we can't actually speak with. Right. So we have to send, if we want to create actual change individually, we have to center ourselves around the things that we actually have the power to do. Otherwise, that powerlessness, that helplessness, that hopelessness is going to continue to build. And then we are not going to be able to actively participate in any of the things we are participating in because we've lost our bravery. We've lost our hope to do something. We've lost that sense of wanting to become in community, you know, sure. be in the community, you know? I percent agree. And um, I think that one of the first things we can do in going through that rage, and I feel it, I can't even tell you how many like lead piece of lead on my pencil I've broken just trying to get it out so fast on paper, but it's, when I think of dismantling, I don't even, I don't necessarily just think about what we can do to dismantle that massive system. I also think about how can I break it down into exactly what you said, what I can control and focus all of my superpower onto that piece. And then once I have a little bit of light, how much hope that gives to go forward to the next piece and how many people can I get each time surrounding more, backing it up until it's a massive wave of change that's coming that doesn't start with the end all be all, which is going to be a massive undertaking that's going to take hundreds of communities all across this country and lots of people that have a lot to lose um, taking really big risks. Right, right. And so I love that you kept it. I love that you were able to give very concrete steps on how we can go about protecting our own neighborhoods, bettering our own neighborhoods, instead of waiting on government to do it because they're not going to make it happen, right? They're going to come around to give us those citations when the yard's not done, but they're not actually going to assist the community in assist that elderly family in being able to do it, right? right? And so that's where community members come in and take care of their own communities. And I love that you were able to offer such like clear, tangible steps from a real estate perspective. You know, that's, that's so valuable. Well, I, pre I appreciate that. And again, I'm doing my best. You're doing, you're fantastic, Keisha. You are so good. You, I, I love everything that you've offered so far. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. We have someone asking us, uh, this is Lisa. She's asking us, how do you feel about the term and identity ghetto? Um, so, uh, Language is a very, language is very important to me. I actually um, 
studied a lot in the tradition of the French feminists. Um, and so I believe that every single word that we utter has power and meaning. Um, I'm always a challenge of certain words used to identify black and brown communities or poor communities and the stereotypes mm -hmm. that go with that. I personally am not one that likes to use ghetto. I don't like to use, I don't like to use the N word. I'm not going to use it here. I don't like to, there's plenty of words that I don't like to use, but I also will not devalue or take away the power of black and brown people that want to own and reclaim those words for themselves. Um, it's just like vagina monologues and the word cunt, right? Um, so there's so many people who are offended by that word, but who are we to take survivors' power away when they choose to reclaim something as their own and identify it for themselves? So it's not a word that I would use in real estate. Um, especially because it's a code and I hate it coded words. So mm. it's a code for really poverty. Um, but then poverty is what a code for black and brownness. Um, right. You know, so we, it gets so multi-layered. So I, I hope that helps that it's not those, those aren't words that uplift me or I feel uplift us. Um, and I try to use words very intentionally, but I also would never try to take someone's power away if they have claimed that word as a piece of identity and a piece of power. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, um, in, in to draw a parallel, right? It's not, an, it's not a one-to-one -one parallel by any means, but to draw a parallel, I identify as queer, but I know that the word queer is, um, uh, is not a word that many humans, especially in, in the older generation of the LGBTQ plus community, are fond of because it was used actively to word them as a derogatory term. Right. And so I would never expect, that's why I'm hesitant about when I even say queer community, I'm very conscious about who is in that space that I'm using that word in, right? Because um, they might not be comfortable identifying that way. And so I do not want to identify somebody in a way that they would not be comfortable with but I identify in a certain way. So it's a little bit of the inverse of what you're saying, um, but the same relationality. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, uh, Keisha, I'd like to uh, pivot to pivot back and talk about, um, you had mentioned earlier to me when we had had a brief conversation before, um, how lack of affordable housing could lead to the situation that we are in today. Yeah. Um, you know, so... This is something that I've thought about a lot that weighs heavily on my heart, especially as I have gotten older and traveled through larger urban environments where um, I don't know. So I don't really know how to define the spaces, but let's just let's just let me just build a picture out here. So all of the things that we've been talking about. So lack of funding and the ability to get loans of any place of your choosing. Um, systematic exclusion from certain places because of a any, any preconceived notions about you. Policies outside of real estate, such as, you know, the, the different city expansions and interstate expansions that went on in the, you know, 60s and 70s across the United States and those impacts. Um, multiple things, the way that property taxes are levied and how that confines certain school districts to maintain where they are versus ever being able to get enough resources. So you start to layer all of these different issues together based on housing and where people literally are located and they're actually trapped and not just in a figurative sense, but there are some communities, especially in urban environments and in you know cities in the South, where once you enter that city from an interstate, once you enter that community, there's almost no way to get out. There's no access to public transit lines that run in any meaningful way. There's no access to grocery stores. There's no access to any sort of healthcare that makes sense to people. Um, there's a lot of things that are missing. And so when you pour on poverty, lack of access to healthcare, you throw us into a pandemic, 
you continuously have issues of police brutality and racial injustice and then lack of opportunities. And this becomes a cycle that goes on for generation and generation and generation until there are there are people who don't even know that there are alternatives to the situation that they're living in that absolutely creates the rage, the looting, the, the, the wanting to tear things down around people, because now you've just added gasoline to a situation of hopelessness and rage that you very eloquently described. And they're, people are tired. We are tired. Enough is enough in terms of we want out of here and we are stuck with these problems with no other way to show you what the suffering looks like. And I really wish that the media would do a better job of showing everything that's going on and not just that zoom in to the one person who's gone and grabbed something or the one person that's throwing a brick. Why, why don't you pan out to the whole right. and why don't you pan out and show people the context of where this is happening? The other thing that's very important about this and talking about property versus the value of human life. Let's talk about how even here in the Tampa Bay area, guess what bridges were immediately blocked off as soon as there were, you know, as soon as we were being told that there were going to be marches and civil disobedience and this like that. We made sure that we blocked off our most, our, our most, you know, our predominantly white and our highest income neighborhoods were completely shut off. And so that was a literal way for you to see how people are excluded. And so people that are outraged, that are looting and burning things to the ground, they are expressing their rage at exclusion. And we don't see it on a daily basis because the cops aren't always there with barricades, but this weekend we got to see it. And again, I really wish that more outlets for people to see these things would pan out and show us a larger overview so that more Americans can understand what is happening and what's going on in communities that are suffering on so many levels that, you know, there's just, there's just so much more that has to be done that I believe can't be done. Right. And I think that context needs to pan out about 400 years, right, yeah. to give us Absolutely. a clear picture. Right, to give us a clear picture, because that's what I was saying at the beginning of this conversation. A lot of it is being treated like it's an isolated incident, which it's not. It's, nope. You can't have the same behavior happening throughout the U.S. in multiple iterations and then call it isolated. Right. Right, and then not look, and then us keep on saying this is years of oppression, decades of oppression, centuries of oppression, and then not do your due diligence of, like you said, panning out and providing that entire context, which then leads back into this 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 one-sided narrative of there's a right way to do things. Absolutely. And, you know, in addition to that, I just want to even let's loop in, let's loop, loop in our labor rights activists, brothers and sisters, you know, let's let's loop all of the, the strikers from the 20s. And, you know, all let's loop all of these people in our Chinese railroad workers that actually executed one of the largest strikes in the United States of America. How many people know that? Well, let's loop right. them in talk about the fact that guess what folks looting is a very real response to a culture that commoditizes life and by that i mean we have for profit healthcare we have a for profit prison system those both directly impact lives so if you're going to make life a commodity then every commodity is fair game when rage mm. is being shown and if i'm a worker if i'm the proletariat and you've abused my commodity, which is my labor, I'm going to take my labor back in the form of the goods that I made for you, that I provided for you. Those are my goods anyway, because that's off my back and my labor. And, you know, please feel free to look up labor history in this country and understand how we have a weekend that has eroded away already. Now I'm just getting all fired up. But anyway, you get my point. Keep going. No, no, this is the space for that. Thank you so much for sharing that, fam. I know there were some fire quotes in there. 
rest assured that this video will be shared on our YouTube. So if y'all want to go back and write some of that those quotes, that is such an excellent argument to bring people to the table. Right because I've been talking over these last few days how do we meet people where they are in having these conversations about writing and looting and I think you made such a fantastic argument you make such a fantastic argument when you say if life is a commodity and everything else is a commodity too then everything is fair game everything's fair game now I everything don't think it's fair game I mean I I again I don't want to say that this is it is not my belief of looting I come from a very um I come from a very pacifist background. My parents worked in the civil rights movement in South Carolina during the time of desegregating schools in the South and registering people to vote in the South. And so very much I'm trained in the ideals and attitudes of MLK, but I will tell you that there are plenty of black folks in the South that realized towards the end of MLK's life which shouldn't have been the end of his life should have been just him getting going but there were lots of people that realized that just asking for this wasn't going to be enough and you know as i got older and was able to make my own ideas of where i come from politically and on social justice i really have included you know anarchist theory labor rights civil rights gender rights all of it it all collides and as long as there are not rights for one and i am not going to get this quote right but as long as there is anyone who as long as there's injustice for anyone there's justice for no one and i believe that right right 100% i absolutely absolutely hear you on the on the fact that on the fact that intersectionality is so important when we have these conversations uh in a conversation that we had yesterday somebody had asked the question you know it's pride month right um how do we celebrate pride month without moving away from what is happening in this current climate without um forgetting about what's happening in this current climate or reducing the conversation and what's happening in this current climate um and i responded and i said well you make sure that you celebrate pride month without ever without by never having a conversation that does not include the plight of black folks in this current moment also you remember what stonewall was all about and who got us there right yep. you remember your history you remember who stood at the front of that history and you keep that in mind and you constantly talk about that because black folk now black folk are lgbtq plus folk and lgbtq plus folk are black too right right so keeping that peace in mind they're not they're not separate from each other yep. that is how you bring it together um I and so that intersectionality piece like you said absolutely absolutely spot on right um We have about 6 minutes left in this okay. conversation. Okay, yeah. I told you, I told you, Kisha. Uh so we have about <laughs> Say that again. That I was so nervous. I was like there's no way we're going to make it an hour. I'm going to lie to you. That's what everybody says. And by the time we get to like we'll sometimes we'll get like the last 30 seconds and I'm like, "Hey, fam, Instagram is showing me that we have 30 seconds left." So Thank you so much for this conversation, right? And we move on from that. But I uh, in these last 6 minutes Um I want to talk a little bit about you mentioned the global pandemic right so I want to talk a little bit about covid-19 I want to talk a little bit about again this it's not devoid of this current context right that it's a, that's that's affecting black humans specifically and then we talk about housing and we're talking about everything that's happened in the pandemic and people not being able to pay their bills people not being able to pay rent so on and so forth um and there was an ordinance that was issued that said you can't evict anyone until June 1st it's June 2nd which is today it's my understanding that that has been moved up to July 1st right and still we know that the likelihood that most of the people who will face the wrath of eviction will be black and brown folk because of that cyclical scale that they are placed on as you uh mentioned very clearly as as you deconstructed for us very clearly earlier What are we looking at? What are we looking at from July 1st? So I haven't even tried to do the projections of what it's going to look like after all of this and the so many people that rent that truly live paycheck to paycheck and literally hour to hour in some regards because 
let's face it, minimum wage is not a living wage and no one should be working three minimum wage jobs to afford to house their family. And the people that are going to be most impacted by this are black and brown women of color that are single moms. And let's put some context around eviction in this country and the mm-hmm. way that it's been used. Um, And understanding that we were already at crisis levels of evictions um, before coronavirus hit. We were already seeing people thrown out in the streets across the country, and it's literally thrown out into the streets. And it creates an almost inescapable cycle, um, especially for people of lower economic status, of lower education, It creates, so you lose your home and now you've got to figure out what you're going to do to live. So maybe you miss your job. So now you lose your job. And so now your car gets repossessed too. So now your credit between your eviction and your car repossession, now your credit's doomed. So now you're back to renting in the same areas where you have the same issues of over evictions in the first place. There's a fantastic novel called, well, not even a novel, it's a, a, a it's a book, non uh, nonfiction called Evicted um, by a gentleman named Matthew Desmond. This particular book takes place in Flint, Michigan, but I think that everybody is served to read this book. He actually came and spoke um, at the Temple Terrace Community Center up by USF and talked about some practical solutions for these things. But it really comes down to the fact that it has to be political will. The money is there. So I'm about to say one of the most unpopular things that I've probably ever said in public on a live forum. But the fact that the credits that people get for their mortgage are 10 times the amount of money that it would take to house evicted and homeless people. That means the money's there. It just means that the will's not there. So what does that mean for someone like me? Well, that means that I painfully give up a piece of my privilege to help house my brothers and sisters that need that to raise themselves up so the whole community can raise up. Because what we have seen is that once once people get a home, it generally takes, uh, and I don't want to quote the stat because I don't know it, but it's a very short amount of time, one to two years before they no longer need any government assistance at all, just by being housing stable. Wow important it is so eviction terrified and um i actually have it on my radar to kind of keep an idea of what's going on especially in certain communities in the tampa bay area that have absentee landlords that are notoriously um insensitive to the needs of the black and brown communities that they actually serve um and so that is on my radar to pay attention to and i hope that If nothing else, this has brought about compassion and understanding and potentially some government aid that will allow property owners to have some patience and compassion because it's a double-sided coin too. And I don't want to just talk about evictions from the side of people who get evicted, even though for me, that is really probably the most important because they're impacted the most. But there are property owners that care that are also paying mortgages. They're also trapped in this cycle of what do I do? So if my renter doesn't pay, how do I pay my mortgage? Then how do how do I make my world happen? And I think that in this regard, there that the money is there if the political will is to allow those people to work together. And, you know, there are many programs that have been put into place that are effective. And I think those should be expanded and it should be easier to access for people as well. There's so many people who don't even know, and that's what this pandemic has proven. Um, There are going to be plenty of people that don't even know what resources are available for them to help with an eviction or to avoid an eviction or temporary housing or anything like that. And, I think that that is a local government's responsibility to get that information. Right. Comes back down to that education piece at the end of it. Right? Always. Well, thank you so much for sharing.